Good afternoon or good morning uh, to folks on the West Coast. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have over 600 of you registered for today's conversation with Acting Comptroller of the Currency, uh, Michael Sue. It's uh, an honor uh, and a pleasure uh, to welcome our members and allies from across the country. And happy Valentine's Day and welcome uh, to another session, uh, another Just Economy session uh, with NCRC. Because it's Valentine's Day, I had to start with, uh, with this. Roses are red, violets are blue. We're here to talk about regulating the banks with acting comptroller Michael <laughs> Sue. Um, so that will uh, form our, our overview and introduction. Um, for those of you who may be new to NCRC or attending an event for the first time, we're a coalition of more than 600 community organizations across the country and individuals who are working to make a just economy a national priority and a local reality. Before we get started, I wanna remind you of our code of conduct. You can read it online, but the really short version is, we expect all interactions within our community to be respectful. We've got about an hour, which is not enough time to cover all the issues we care about, uh, but we'll do our best to talk about some that are on the national agenda right now, like the status of joint rulemaking to modernize and strengthen the Community Reinvestment Act, fair lending, and how to sure, ensure banks are meeting the needs of all communities. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Sue, who President Biden appointed as acting comptroller of the currency. Uh, Mike grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and before his appointment, he served as an associate director in the Division of Supervision and Regulation at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and co-chaired the Federal Reserve Systemic Risk Integration Forum. I'm sure to most people on the line, he needs no introduction. Um, the comptroller will kick us off with some opening remarks and then he and I will chat a bit. Uh, we'll answer some questions submitted by NCRC members. Uh, and if you're not a member, please consider taking a look at our website and joining and supporting NCRC. Uh, we have membership uh, tiers for both organizations and individuals. So Mike, welcome, uh, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. Thanks for having me. And I wish I had a Valentine's Day poem to match yours, but I'm not that witty right now. Maybe, maybe some audience members can, uh, can help me out. Um, I've been trying to think what rhymes with Van Toll, but it's a little bit harder than Sue. In any case, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, as many of you know, reducing inequality is a top priority for me and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. One important step in doing so is strengthening and modernizing the regulation implementing the Community Reinvestment Act to expand financial access and inclusion for low and moderate income communities. In the not too distant future, the OCC, Federal Reserve, and FDIC will release a joint CRA notice of proposed rulemaking. It will reflect the Herculean efforts of staff from all three banking agencies who've been working around the clock for months, building off of each of their many years of practical experience with the CRA and thinking about how to make it better. Before the NPR is released though, and everyone goes into comment mode on the nitty gritty details, I believe now is a good time to take a step back to remind ourselves of the CRA's roots, reflect on where we are today and consider where we need to go. Let me start with the CRA's history. When the CRA was enacted in 1977, it was one of a series of landmark laws in which Congress sought to reverse decades of discrimination in many areas. The CRA was designed to complement the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act, and to help address discriminatory lending and disinvestment that all too often had left urban, often minority communities without fair access to credit and financial services. The CRA encouraged banks and thrifts to serve in a, man in a manner consistent with safe and sound operations, the entire communities and markets where they were chartered to do business. Such services could not be limited to deposit taking, as many banks at the time took deposits, but did not lend or provide other banking services to those communities. Discriminatory practice had been widespread for decades, including in government. The redlining maps that epitomized the era were in fact created by the federal government. 
Red lines mark neighborhoods, typically those home to Black, Hispanic, and other minority or poorer households, deemed by federal agencies as high credit risks. For example, the Homeowners Loan Corporation was established in 1933 by the federal government to help refinance home mortgages in default. The HOLC created and used color-coded maps to gauge the relative risk of lending in some areas, and typically delineated as hazardous areas with large minority populations, poor households, and older housing stock. As a result, many banks did not lend in these redlined areas, even as they took deposits from them and invested those deposits in other communities. Potential borrowers in these neighborhoods either could not get or had to pay much more for loans for home mortgages, for repairing homes, for starting and operating small businesses, tools critical for accumulating generational wealth. The lack of available credit in those communities often resulted in block after blighted block of homes and businesses in need of revitalization. The passage of the CRA in 1977 was meant to help address these injustices. In the years and decades following its adoption, the CRA had the intended effect of increasing lending in low and moderate income neighborhoods, enabling borrowers in these communities to have fair access to credit to better their lives. Despite that progress, however, over time, it became clear that further improvements were needed. In December 1993, the federal banking agencies issued a proposal to improve the CRA regulation and the examination process, which the agencies finalized in 1995, addressing concerns that implementation of the CRA had become more procedural than substantive while also noting successes of the CRA in expanding credit to all segments of society. As a result of those changes, CRA loan commitments increased significantly. Again, however, over time, areas needing further improvement emerged. And as I will discuss next, the need for a stronger CRA has become clear. There have been several attempts in the intervening years to address these issues. The stars did not align across the agencies, community organizations, and the banking industry until recently. Where are we today? Banks have made substantial investments of CRA dollars in LMI communities over the past four decades to the benefit of LMI individuals, small businesses, and communities. Nonetheless, significant disparities continue to exist in many LMI areas and are most prevalent for Black, Hispanic, and Native American communities and borrowers across our nation. These disparities and the pandemic's disproportionate impact on minority, rural, and other vulnerable communities have contributed to a wide gap in financial well being between Black, Hispanic, and white house households. Less than two thirds of Black and Hispanic adults report that they are doing, quote, okay financially, compared to 80% of white adults. Black and Hispanic households are around five times more likely to be unbanked than white households. And in rural areas where banks have fewer traditional branches, residents face similar challenges with limited access to financial services, lower incomes and wealth, and higher unemployment. In Indian country, the need for financial access and CRA investments is especially great, with one analysis finding a $50 billion unmet need on tribal lands for infrastructure to build a better quality of life for Native Americans. These disparities have also persisted with regards to wealth. Studies have shown that the wealth gap between Black and white Americans in modern times is roughly the same as it was more than 50 years ago before the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In both 2016 and 1962, Average wealth for white families was almost seven times greater than that of black families. Because wealth opens doors to economic opportunities, such as financing college, home purchases, small businesses, medical and other emergencies, the persistence of racial wealth inequality is a significant barrier to advancement for families of color, their communities, and their future generations. On a local level, black borrowers in black majority neighborhoods often face markedly higher interest rates on business loans, lower bank branch density, less local banking concentration in home mortgages, and less small business growth. Communities of color across the nation have generally had less access to banks, credit unions, and mortgage lenders, and other neighborhood amenities than majority white majority areas. The cities of Baltimore, Detroit, Oakland, and Philadelphia in particular have among the widest gaps. The lack of traditional financial institutions in Black and Hispanic neighborhoods often leaves minority borrowers with little choice other than to turn to high interest financial services such as check cashers and payday lenders. Perhaps most worrisome, some challenges appear to be not just persistent, but possibly getting worse. One recent study found that in 2020, the mortgage denial rate was 84% higher for black applicants than white applicants, an increase of 10 percentage points since 2019. And black homeownership had fallen to 44% from 49.7% in 2004. 
In addition, Black entrepreneurs and small business owners often face barriers to the credit needed to start, operate, and grow their businesses. One study found that Black-owned businesses were about twice as likely to be denied credit, even after controlling for differences in credit worthiness and other factors, suggesting that credit access could be linked to racial discrimination. Thus, despite the clear positive impacts that the CRA has had over the past several decades, LMI communities and communities of color continue to face significant barriers to full access to financial services and participation in the economy. So as I will discuss next, changes in the banking system have added urgency in other dimensions to the need to update the CRA. To put forward a rule that strengthens and modernizes the CRA to address these inequities, I committed the OCC to working on an interagency basis with the FDIC and the Federal Reserve. Our interagency discussions have been guided by our experiences implementing the CRA and a strong collective commitment to improving it. The Fed's advanced notice of proposed rulemaking published in September of 2020 has served as the basic framework. Several overarching objectives are guiding our effort to update the CRA this time. From my perspective, it's important that revised CRA regulations result in increased levels of CRA activity to help address the persistent disparities noted earlier. At the same time, we need to ensure that banks are engaging with and being responsive to local stakeholders and local needs of LMI communities, not just applying one size fits all solutions. In short, the new CRA regs should ensure more and better CRA investments. Second, I believe it is important that we increase the clarity, consistency, and transparency of our CRA supervisory expectations and standards regarding which activities are eligible for CRA credit and how eligible activities are evaluated and assessed. This should allow banks to move more quickly and with greater confidence when making CRA investments. Finally, we need to update the CRA standards to reflect changes in the business of banking, in particular, the increased use of mobile and internet delivery channels. This last point warrants some elaboration. Banks today serve and invest broadly in communities across the nation. They lend in communities well beyond the specific branch focus and areas they served when the CRA was enacted in 1977. At that time, thousands of community banks served smaller geographically contained areas. Today, while many community banks continue to have this local focus, others are being acquired by larger banks or merging with peers. Industry consolidation is concentrating banking assets in the hands of fewer and larger banking institutions. And home mortgage lending is dominated by a few banks and non-bank institutions lending nationwide, including internet banks with few or no branches serving a wide geography. Under the current CRA rules, the CRA performance of most internet banks who serve customers across the country must be focused only on where they are headquartered or have deposit taking ATMs. This internet-based bank business model did not exist, nor was it envisioned when the federal banking agencies made significant updates to our CRA regs in 1995. In just two years after, uh, in 1985, just two years after the, the source code for internet, the internet was uh, first released to the public. In addition, banks that have traditionally relied on large, a large network of brick and mortar branches to serve customers are increasingly closing branches to save costs and refocus on online and mobile banking. From 2010 to 2021, banks closed 15,500 branches. And throughout this period, majority black census tracts were less likely to have a bank branch in the non-majority Black neighborhoods. Together, these trends have resulted in lending patterns that weren't addressing. For example, recent analysis by the Urban Institute shows how much more CRA-eligible mortgage and small business lending banks do in LMI areas that are inside their CRA assessment areas than they do in LMI areas outside their assessment areas, which results in credit needs of underbanked LMI areas often going unmet. Studies like this and other factors have helped to convince banking regulators and stakeholders that it is insufficient to continue to evaluate bank CRA performance solely on a, a branch-based model. This leaves too many underserved communities in need of investment and financial access. Broadening our evaluation of bank CRA performance to more appropriately reflect the, the communities the banks serve, including rural areas and Indian country, is necessary to live up to the core promise of the CRA. So in conclusion, uh, our joint NPR to strengthen and modernize the CRA will be released for public comment uh, in the not too distant future. I would encourage all stakeholders to review it and submit comments. All comments will be carefully reviewed and considered as the banking agencies work together to draft a final rule. Remembering our history and being open and honest about the challenges facing us today 
can help guide us as we move forward. I'm confident that by working together and with input from interested stakeholders like all of you, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, and FDIC can strengthen and modernize the CRA regs in a manner that can meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Jesse, and we can have a uh, discussion. Great, thanks, Mike. And uh, I'll just note at the outset, you have a pending rulemaking. And so um, as such, there are limits on, on yeah. what you can say about particularities within the rule. We know we got a lot of questions from members about specific aspects of the rule. Um, we'll try to um, we'll try to keep it at a process level at a high level here, understanding there's a limited amount you can say. But um, you said you said soon. Uh, how soon is soon? Uh, and do you think it's it's realistic, uh, Mike, that um, CRA in terms of an NPR and then a final rule could be? finalize this year yet? Um, so you know, I'll stick to my phrase in the not too distant future. Um, the, I think the good news is staff at all three agencies really have been, I'm, I'm not lying when I say they've been working around the clock together. And I really wanna emphasize that together, kind of working through uh, the NPR. As Jesse, as you and many of your members know, it's a pretty complicated rule. There are a lot of parts to it. And uh, we want it, it's important to get it right. and. I know there's a lot of urgency on this for the reasons I described uh, in my remarks, but also for the reason that your members know that we, we really do need to move on this uh, as soon as possible. So that's certainly felt and we've got a commitment on it, but I just wanna make, I think everyone wants to make sure we get it right. Um, there have been a number of attempts at this before and they've all failed. So we wanna be a little bit humble in our ability to pull this off, but soon, I can, I can say soon. <laughs> And, and, and Mike, you started to describe uh, some of the gaps, uh, mm -hmm. thinking about places where there are no banks, yeah. uh, rural communities, um, uh, you know, places that are underserved by banks, Indian country. Um, you know, and there are, there are places when, when CRA was originally passed, as you said, didn't contemplate um, internet banking. Um, but also in the way that, that CRA sort of sets up the whole evaluation, you know, if you're in a place, you get evaluated, but if you're not in a place, you don't get evaluated. So there are whole, uh, you know, there are banks that uh, just completely skip over the entire state of Mississippi, you know, go Florida, <laughs> Alabama, Louisiana. Um, what, what in your mind are those, those big gaps? You spoke to wealth versus income, you spoke to racial disparities um, that, that remain unaddressed, persistent, and in some cases getting work worse. What, what are the big gaps or what are the big priorities to address in terms of the problem as so, you conduct reform? So I, I think you just I think you just tick through them, Jesse. And I think that this is to me it's really important to kind of go back to the history of I think the history of this year really does provide a compass for us on this, because you know our our we don't have red line maps anymore, but yet we still have significant disparities. I tick through some of them. You tick through some of them. Some of them are geographic. Some of them are by um, uh, communities. Some of them by are, are by groups. And I think we want a really full and honest look at what those gaps are and what we're attempting to do in the revised, you know, in, in, in the joint uh, NPR is to identify and provide some uh, uh, approaches to those. And this is where we really need help from the commenters. We really need help from an input and feedback from uh, folks who are close to the ground and living it and seeing it and saying, okay, did we get this right? You know, are we making sure, are we covering those gaps? Are we meeting the spirit and the purpose of the CRA um, so that everyone's got an equal opportunity? That, that's, the, that's the core promise. And so we're, we're, we, we think that we've covered that, but uh, you know, it, it's the devil's in the details. And, and I'll ask you a question that you don't have power over. So you can't, you can't get tripped up with your lawyers on this one. So uh, uh, Chairman Powell speaking at our conference last year, you know, said like activities should be mm -hmm. uh, regulated similarly or, or, or like activities should have like regulation. Um, and, and, you know, that was taken to mean that looking at mortgage companies, looking at 
um, you know, some some things that are outside of the banking system, but either you know could be in the banking system one day. Looking at say stablecoin, uh, you know, fintech. Um, you know, should these things have uh, uh, these companies have an affirmative obligation to serve every community? So I think uh, Chair Powell and I are uh, uh, probably seeing eye to eye on this. I think short answer is yes. Uh, like activities, like regulation. You know, I've 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 been focused quite a bit on this issue on the regulatory perimeter um, because I think at this particular time things are changing. I think we are we are in a day and age where a lot of this stuff is moving around as to who's doing what with regards to banking. And I define banking, I think the traditional definition of banking is taking deposits, making loans, facilitating payments. And if you're doing all three of those things, then you know, usually in the old days, you're a bank. And now you know uh, these things can be kind of accomplished through a whole variety of means, sometimes outside of the bank regulatory perimeter, outside of the CRA. And so this is something that I think has garnered a lot of attention and discussion, which is right, because we want to make sure that, in effect, the CRA gets arbitraged. We don't want that. You know, we, we need uh, uh, everyone to kind of be rowing in the same direction to ensure that everyone's got access to credit. Um, now, in stablecoins, I don't know if you want to talk about stablecoins specifically. It's a hot topic these days. I'm going I'm to go into stablecoins a bit more in a moment. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, I, I guess the point is, you know, some of these activities are occurring. They may be disintermediated. They may not be inside of one institution. They may be inside of one institution with different parts. Right. Um, you know, there are companies out there, payments companies that uh, have tens of billions of dollars in stored value sitting in accounts. Certainly looks like a deposit. Um, you know, they're starting to make loans. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing all of the things that you describe and yet are, are really um, skirting the edge of, of regulation. And, you know, stablecoin specifically, if it's to sit inside uh, the banking system or, or somehow within the banking regulation perimeter, um, and, and there's some uh, either insurance or backing of a stablecoin one-to-one with U.S. dollars, doesn't it start to look like a deposit? Uh, it certainly can. Um, now, I think that the um, here I'll probably, excuse me, I'm going to map to the PWG report a little bit, but I'm going to elaborate a, a, a bit. The two, to me, the two key concerns with stable coins, first is that as they're currently designed, they're prone to runs. And as we all know, runs, runs are, can cause indiscriminate damage and hurt innocent folks. And I think in this case, you know, this is a key vulnerability for the entire crypto ecosystem. A lot of these platforms, um, they rest on stable coins. Like the stable coins kind of are the oxygen uh, for a lot of these platforms. And nowadays, you know, crypto is going mainstream. I think anyone who was watching the Super Bowl yesterday got inundated with a bunch of crypto ads. Uh, and that's, that, I think, is a sign of the times. And if uh, there's trouble in that space, I think a lot of innocent investors are going to get hurt. And so we want to make sure that that run risk um, is well managed. And there's kind of a corollary to that. There's contagion risk from crypto to traditional finance. And that's something I think about all the time uh, as a banking regulator. But the second one is one that hasn't been talked about as much with stable coins, and that's payment systems risk. Can it function as a, pay, as a, as a medium of exchange? Because that's the promise that the stable coin, you can pay for stuff with it. And that's more complicated than people realize. I think that you know, the promise of blockchain is that it's de this decentralized, you know, uh, fast, secure thing. But the reality is that blockchains are not interoperable. And so when you're, you've got stable coins moving across different blockchains, there is some, there's a lot going on in the background that uh, cannot just be assumed. And, you know, again, as a bank regulator, as someone who wants to see these kinds of technologies and, and innovations succeed and do well for consumers, we got to make sure that the, the things that need to be solid are solid. And so that that's, you know, in the DOCC, we've got some deep experience with both runs and payment systems. So we think we can, we have a perspective to offer on this, uh, but we're in the early days, I think of a lot of discussion. Are we thinking about um, these issues in the wrong way to an extent? I mean, we, we think about 
stable coin or or blockchain you know sort of what's happening in crypto is is something to be regulated on the other hand you know the underlying blockchain technology uh, you know there's been a lot of focus on on what fraud may be occurring out there mm-hmm. in the universe in the crypto space you mentioned a lot of the risks and concerns and and we very much share those concerns you know on the other hand um uh, you think about blockchain and, and its ability to achieve um, sort of perfect fidelity of information. You can imagine that in a regulatory context, that ability might actually be quite useful uh, in rooting out fraud, for example, in ensuring uh, faster payments and, and, and indeed in protecting consumers. Can you uh, speak for a moment, uh, Mike, about the strengths or the, the, sure. the opportunities that you see and really in the context of regulators as an actor in this space as well? Yeah, so I think I think again, just I think you hit on some of these things where um, uh, there is a record. There's an immutable record, and it's visible for all to see, depending on how the blockchain is set up. And uh, currently, there is certainly a lot of secrecy, transparency issues, but there's also some some transparency pluses. And I think what you're seeing now is that uh, you know the DOJ just recently had um, you know they 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 recovered several billion dollars worth of of laundered money on a, uh, a crypto, in part because they're able to kind of take advantage of some of those features that you were just talking about. And I think that's a microcosm of across the space, can blockchain enabled payments be faster and more secure and cheaper? Yeah, I think that possibility is there. I think if you read, um, there's great research out, out there about how today's payment system in the US is regressive, it hurts people who need to use it the most, poor people. Uh, and anything we can do to improve that is good for them. And so in that sense, I'm excited. I, th- I think that there is some possibility there, but at the same time, there's tons of scams, lots of fraud, you know, illicit activity. So like any new technology, it can be a tool, it can be a weapon, it can be a force for good, it can be a force for bad. Like, you know, my job is to, is to help navigate that so we get more of the good and less of the bad, um, you know, as, as, as things move forward. And it's not always easy, um, but it does take, uh, it takes a village because it, it really does require us to kind of get inputs from all, all the different stakeholders. And how do you view the intersection of the federal government in that context, you know, OCC or otherwise? I mean, potentially you think about the, the, the programmability of, of a digital coin, uh, mm-hmm potentially it's used in a smart contract, something like delivering benefits to people uh, Mm -hmm. through a smart contract, you know, series of if then statements. If your W2 says you make less than X, Mm -hmm. you instantly clear a certain benefit uh, into your bank account. And potentially this is disruptive, not just in the private context, but in the federal context as well. Yeah, again, I'm I'm very uh, open-minded to all of these, uh, use cases. I think this is now the the term of the term of the year. Use case. Uh, I think what we want to be really clear about, though, is let's let's specify what the use. What, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And you know, I think you often hear this um, critique of blockchain, which I think is partly true. It's a solution in search of a problem. So it's a cool it's a cool technology. It can be used for a lot of things, but in many cases, if you talk to folks who are actually working with the technology. And they'll say, hey, let me apply blockchain technology to fill in the blank. They play around with it for a little bit and they come back and say, mm, not great. <laughs> it helps a little bit. It's actually quite expensive and, it's, and it uses a lot of computing power. And there's, there's all sorts of other issues with it. I think that's often the case. So that doesn't take away from the promise there. I think there is promise there. But I think we want to be clear-eyed and objective about what we're trying to solve. So if it is that hey, we want to make things easier for those who are vulnerable, those who are you know, LMI uh, individuals with regards to tax filing and other things. Maybe there's other solutions in addition to blockchain we should be thinking about. I, I think that that's a healthy, uh, you, you want almost like healthy competition of ideas on innovation, not just, hey, I've got a new toy and I want to use it in, in, in every way imaginable, which has, there's a little bit of that feel with, the, with blockchain. And Mike, you know, sort of the catchphrase of, of the post-financial crisis era was, was too big to fail. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're in the, you know, the crypto era. Some have dubbed the Super Bowl, which you mentioned, is, is the crypto Super Bowl for the number of crypto ads uh, that ran. But but I'm wondering, you know, have we reached a, an, an era where innovation within the financial services space is, is, is too nimble to regulate? Um, and for that matter, um, you know, uh, we've seen post-financial crisis, you know, any number of consent orders against mm-hmm. large banks. Um, um, you know, people talk about too, too big to fail you know, isn't in some ways needing to take a consent order or needing to take an enforcement action a failure of supervision? You know, should we be thinking about too big to regulate? So too nimble to regulate, too big to regulate. The challenge of regulating in a rapidly evolving financial landscape, the regulators have all the tools, Mm -hmm. staffing expertise that they need really to regulate uh, both very large institutions and very nimble institutions. Yeah. So within the banking space, so I, th- I think it depends on what level you're looking at. Um, within the regulated bank space, I can speak for OCC chartered uh, regulated banks. I feel like we have the tools we need. We have the communications devices we need. Uh, we supervise uh, as necessary and we take the actions we need to. Um, and we have been taking a careful, cautious approach to crypto in the national banking system. And we've done that through, through a variety of means. We're not against it. We're open to it. We want to make sure it's done safe, sound, and fair. That is, that's important. If it's done in the national banking system, it will be safe, sound, and fair. Crypto presents a number of challenges because it's not clear who to grab, what to grab, who has jurisdiction. It crosses into all these different places in ways that are uh, a, a bit uncertain. And I think you're seeing this play out with, you know, just like in the stablecoin debate, is it a security? Is it a deposit? Is it a bank? Is it a platform? DeFi, great example. Like there's not even an entity. It's just code. So there's a lot of novel issues. Now, I think a lot of the risks are familiar. They feel familiar. You know, is there proper disclosure? Is this innovation, is it responsible? Is it, is it, is it a scam? Like those, those are not new concepts. I think how we deal with that from a regulatory perspective, that part is new. And it really argues for a lot of extra coordination and collaboration across agencies. This I feel very strongly about. No one agency can tackle this. It really does require all of us talking to each other, working together, you know, agreeing. How are we going to tackle this? Who's on first? You know that these are these are not easy questions um, uh, to answer, but we have to do it together. Otherwise, there's just going to be a, you know a Swiss cheese of of uh, in, the, in the perimeter, uh, and uh, you know risk will find the the weakest spot and just blow through it. So we we want to be really careful in how we do that. You mentioned the phrase regulatory arbitrage earlier, yeah. and and you're speaking here of you know, sort of entities or co sort of nebulous to regulate who has regulatory authority. There's, there's one activity that, that you might think of it as a form of, or I think of it as a form of sort of reverse regulatory arbitrage. So, you know, there are companies, non-bank companies uh, offering uh, uh, loans at high rates sort of through a relationship with banks that are inside the banking system, sometimes called rent to charter. Um, how, how, how do you view that practice, yeah. um, Mike? So I think uh, there's, there's two objectives that I think we can all agree on. Uh, the first is there should be no predatory lending and no rent to charter arrangements in the national banking system. And the second is banks should be inclusive and innovative in meeting the needs of the communities they serve. So those two things, I think we can all agree, those are two objectives that we can get fully behind. I think these bank FinTech partnerships, they create risk and opportunities on both fronts. Because let's be, let's, let's be super clear, right now what's happening in banking is, banking is getting digitalized and banks need help in doing that. Not all banks, but some banks, they need help in doing that. So they're not gonna just build all of those capabilities in-house, they're gonna reach out and they're gonna work with, with, with FinTechs or technology firms or others to help them do that. So we can't, we can't just paint with a broad brush that they're all good or they're all bad. 
There are some that are good, there are some that are bad. I think we have to go back to those principles, which is no predatory lending, no rent a charter. And banks need to innovate. They need to keep up, they need to modernize uh, to be able to meet the needs of everybody. And so that's kind of keep, I, I go back to those principles. And of course, you know, we're, we, you gotta look at the details then. And that, that's where we are now is trying to understand, you know, what are the, what are the details around some of these arrangements? Um, what does good look like? Uh, where, where, do, where are their problems? And here we, we rely a lot, not rely, but we take a lot of input from uh, uh, community organizations like yours and others who are saying, hey, we see a problem here. You know, raise our hand. Hey, we see a problem here. This is not good. And often we've, we've, uh, we have some awareness of that. We're already working on it. In some cases it's new and we get on the case, uh, but that's, that's part of the process, I think, uh, to get to the right place. Thank you. I'm going to shift back a little bit to um, bank mergers and consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, the president last year issued a, an executive order uh, on uh, competition, consolidation generally, but but also specifically around bank mergers. Um, and uh, uh, Marty Grunberg, as acting chair of the FDIC, has um, certainly shared his intention uh, to, to work on an interagency basis. And I know you as a board member of the FDIC voted for their RFI, but, but how is the OS, OCC thinking differently about bank mergers or, or, or what process will you go through to evaluate your own merger procedures? So I, I definitely think that now uh, the time is ripe to review how we assess bank mergers. And, and that's really because the banking system has changed a lot and is under uh, pressure to adapt in part to digitalization, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, of the four prongs of the bank merger analysis, I believe the one that needs the most work is the financial stability prong. And if I had to sum that up, it's a comp there's a lot of complexities around it, but if I had to sum it up, I think we really need to figure out how to both prevent new too big to fail firms from forming, and at the same time promoting large bank competition. We have to do both of those things. And I fear right now there's a lot of, a lot of the dialogue is either all one or all the other. And, and all one or other the other is not a good place for us. We have to solve for both of those things. And I think we can, I know we can, um, but I think that, that that's the one that kind of needs the most work. Um, uh, the convenience and needs prong uh, and the competition prong also warrant review. And I think as you and your members probably saw recently, uh, we did, we are gonna host a public meeting for the USB MUFG proposed merger. I think it's important. I think it's the first public meeting of a, of a merger of that size to get the full community input. Like that's important. I think this is something that you and others have advocated for is that, hey, we need a voice at the table. Um, I'll tell a story. I, I was talking to um, uh, uh, a bank CEO at one point who was kind of working, walking through uh, his banks, some of the things he was most proud of on the diversity inclusion and on the kind of inclusion front. And he talked about this, this branch that, that they had uh, in, a, in an area that was kind of underserved. And he was said, it's wildly successful, wildly successful, tons of foot traffic, clearly helping the community, just all these great things. And I asked him about the history of the branch. And he said, well, we were gonna close it, but then we had a bank merger and the community groups jumped in and they, they really um, advocated for a particular branch. And he said, we didn't know. It was one of those, we, we weren't aware of how valuable and important it was for the community and they kept it. And so that just, you know, it's kind of my, it, and I'm kind of stating the obvious, I'm preaching to the choir on this, uh, but I think it is important on that front that, that we build that into the process, but we've got to work through our own internal processes to get to a point where that's commonplace, that that's the standard, that that's the standard that we're, that we're using. Um, so we got some work to do um, uh, on, on, on all these things. And I should have noted, I've started to move into NCRC member questions. That was <laughs> one from, from Jimmy Weisberg of NHD, <laughs> Kevin Stein from CRC, and several other members were sort of combining uh, some, some member comments. Mike, Mike, just to follow up on that, you know, um, I think a number of standards, you know, anti-competitive effect, <laughs> too big to fail, Mm -hmm. um, you know, have been treated sort of as tipping point standards. You get above a certain size, ah. uh, you get above a certain concentration, 
you know, boom, you're anti-competitive, boom, you're too big to fail. You know, is, isn't, uh, isn't that effect created over time? In other words, doesn't a merger um, at every size have sort of small but accretive effect uh, on anti-competition or on too big to fail? I mean, we have advocated for, you know, I think written into banking law is this notion that the public benefit should exceed any adverse effect. It's a recognition that there can be adverse effects, whether it's branch closures, job losses, loss of a product. I mean, sometimes very small banks merge yeah. and one bank has a great product that's good and the other bank has a less good product and they, you know, the bank ends up keeping the less good product. Right. Um, and so, you know, should the standard for public benefit be higher? Shouldn't we be looking at this along the way, not just kind of once you're so big, we need to break you up or once you're so big, we need to think about negative consequences. Um, isn't it along the way? Is it a, is it a spectrum? I, I think the, the, the likely answer is yes to your question. Um, I do think there are some trade-offs that have to be considered. And uh, there's, you know, I'm keen on getting the analysis of all the questions that you just raised. I think these competition questions are live. I think a lot of people are, are talking about it. Uh, you know, the DOJ put out uh, a request for comment on some of this competition uh, analysis. I think that I think that may close today or you know soon. But folks should folks should weigh in if, if you feel strongly about it and have thoughts because we're going to be reading all of those. You know, we're we're we are working. We are kind of uh, we have contact. We're in contact with DOJ on on this on these kinds of issues. There is a trade off though, and I do think that. You know, we do want there to be clarity for banks so that they kind of know where those lines are so they can operate in a way. Because you're right, Jesse, there's, there's always a spectrum on everything. <laughs> you know, we, we don't live in a black and white world. Um, uh, so we have to weigh uh, taking into account that spectrum on a whole bunch of different dimensions with just operational, operationally just getting stuff done <laughs> and being able to kind of kind of move through life in a way that's got some uh, some predictability to it so people can make decisions. And we'll just weigh those trade-offs. You know, I think we're going to consider all these things. But your general question feels, I think the short answer is yes. You know, we, should, we should be raising the bar on these things. I think the question is how. You know, what do we focus on? How do we do it? How do we weigh those trade-offs in a smart way so that it leads to a better outcome for everybody? So, so Mike, we're going uh, to play a little game now. Uh -oh. since, it is, since it is Valentine's Day, and I've, I've condensed a number of questions uh, that we've received from members down into their simplest form. So we're going to approach bank regulatory issues, and I promise to do this in a way that uh, that doesn't get you in trouble with your wife. But we're going to okay. we're going to approach <laughs> bank regulatory issues as if they were on a dating app, and you're going to swipe left <laughs> or swipe right. And 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 I'll just um, I'm not going to assume, Mike, that you've ever been on a dating app. So swipe I, I right means, so it, right means, means what? yes. Right okay. means yes, agree, accept, want to learn more about that. Left means no, rejected. And since you are a bank regulator, I'm going to give you a chance to give a more nuanced ah, thank you. Uh, answer. Uh, okay, swipe uh, down to a comment box or something. <laughs> so, swipe down into the regulatory process with a, with, uh, with a notice of proposed rulemaking. But all right, so swipe right is yes, left is no. We're just going to go through a few issues here. Uh, one of them is overdraft. Mm -hmm. Swipe left or swipe right on overdraft. Ah, so this I am actually very passionate about. I am going to swipe down because I think that this, and, and I'm glad you framed it this way, Jesse, because I want to talk about this. I feel like um, this particular product is often framed this way. Are you for or against it? You know, are you a swipe right or a swipe left guy? And I think the reality is much more complicated than that. I think there are instances where uh, an overdraft program, particularly traditional overdraft programs, are net on net harmful. And I've made a whole speech about this, and I've talked about this. How um, you know the, the history of overdrafts is they started off infrequently used as a deterrent, and they turned into something much more than that. And you know. Um, I don't have to cite the literature. Your, your, your members and your communities know this better than anyone else, that it, it, it extract, it's very regressive. 
at the end of the day, it's, it can be very aggressive. At the same time, people need access to short-term liquidity and credit. So to take it away, we have to ask ourselves for certain people in certain situations, that's a net negative for them. So I think we have to be really careful about how we approach this. And you know, I've been drawn to um, these frameworks like a financial health framework is does, does it make, is it, is it healthy for the user and the way the program is constructed? And I think this is very interesting. Now we're seeing a little bit of a race to the top by some of the larger banks on how to reform their overdraft programs. I'm hugely encouraging of that, that they're, they're doing different things. 24, 48 hour grace periods, grace amounts, throttling payments, like this is good. These are pro-consumer, they're empowering. And I think we wanna see what is most pro-consumer. It doesn't really fit your swipe right or swipe left because you know, if, you, if you swipe right and say, you know, do away with them, I think you're gonna be taking away, you risk not just preventing harm, but taking away a valuable tool. And if you swipe left and say, no, we should keep them, then you risk kind of leaving in place some harmful practices. And so I think we, we just need to do better. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's- Yes, but other way work. around, left is reject. Left oh, is sorry. We're not gonna <laughs> See, keep it I already right. got it wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. No. So I'm hearing from that, Mike, you know, swipe right on, uh, short-term small dollar loan products, which which might be inclusive of certain overdraft programs. You know, people can run out of money, uh, but mm -hmm. but swipe left on on junk fees or on things that don't add value uh, to the end consumer or get them stuck in a uh, in a in a cycle of of just paying high fees um, uh, for overdraft products. I'm paraphrasing, you didn't exactly say that, but, but <laughs> that's what I'm gonna go with. We're gonna jump around a little bit, Mike, broad okay. range of topics. Okay. Climate change is a risk to the banking system. So right, swipe right would be yes, swipe no would be left. I would sorry, swipe left would be no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm, I, I'll stay away from the directions. So I'll just, <laughs> cause I wanna screw that up. Uh, yeah, climate change uh, presents risks to safety and soundness. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been saying I can elaborate why do you more. Think this is, why do you think this is such a debate, Mike? I mean, ah. I was I was ah. struck. I was struck. You know, you can think of COVID and the disruption to supply chains as just a minor, you know, dry run for what you could see. I mean, we saw in the middle of the crisis. Um, you remember this uh, this ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal? I believe it was yep. the Suez Canal. Um, you know, and, and there was global panic and concern. It was starting to affect markets that, you know, this one ship getting stuck in the canal could block, you know, weeks and weeks of deliveries, deliveries to market economies, you know, on the other side of the world that could, could, could impact markets in a major way and presumably banks as well. You can imagine that the effects of climate change, which, you know, I would say we're already starting to see could certainly impact one canal in the middle of the world. Um, and if one canal can impact supply chain systems to the extent that they potentially impact markets, it seems obvious that climate change poses a risk. Yeah, so um, I, I will reiterate, I do think climate change poses risk to safety and soundness, but I wanna answer your question. You know, Cause your question was why, why all this noise around it? Uh, and I think this is an, there's an important uh, nuance to my answer, which I want to be really, really clear about. OCC, what's our mission? Safety and soundness of the banking system, fair treatment, uh, fair access for customers. So we've got safety, soundness, and fairness. That's part of our mission. So this is squarely within that mission. In other jurisdictions, the climate change uh, topic has another part. It's not just safety and soundness. There's this other goal of accelerating the transition to a net zero carbon economy. That is not in our mandate. And I think it's that second part that um, raises concerns by some folks that me, Mike Sue, uh, acting comptroller of the currency or other bank regulators are gonna use our safety and soundness authorities to enact that second objective. As a citizen of the US, of the world, do I care about that? Absolutely. As the acting comptroller, I don't have that mandate. So we're focused on the safety and soundness aspects. That's, that's, that's our job. We would not be doing our jobs if we weren't calling out climate change on, the, on the, that front. And there's plenty to do there. 
I don't want to minimize that is that is hard work. And we've you know, we put out principles uh, for for a comment. I think that comment period closes soon. Um, that's all for large banks, 100 billion and above. We're going to be working with the Fed and the FDIC on that. But that second part, I think we have to be um, clear that that is not in 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 my mandate to do that second part. And I think that's where the, some of the concerns about cutting off fossil fuel companies and, and that kind of thing. Other countries do have that. We don't have that here. That Congress has to tell me to do that. And so I just want to be, and I think I want to, because I want to answer your question, because there has been noise around this. And I, I, my fear is that concerns about that second part get in the way of the first part. And that's what we really need to do. Like banks need to know their risk. They have to identify their risks measure them, manage them. That's really, really important. Every banker I talk to acknowledges that. And so we're trying to help on that front, but it's getting kind of caught up on the second part, which again, I, I subscribe to as a, as, a, as a citizen, but I think within my job uh, responsibilities, it's really focused on that first part. Thank you. Um, we're going we're gonna to move around again. So this one comes back uh, to CRA um, and it, it's sort of goes back to where you started in your opening remarks. So uh, addressing redlining, mm -hmm. which was racialized discrimination and racial disparities through CRA. Swipe right for yes, swipe left for no. So this one I went to swipe up and defer. Uh, my lawyers are gonna tackle me. So as you know, we're, we're just to put, about to put out, this, this is a hot topic, right? This was kind of asked in the, in the Fed's ANPR. There have been a lot of comments about this. A lot of discussion about that. So I'm going to hold back and, and let the NPR speak for itself. A lot of, there's a lot of folks working on this. Um, as you know, you know, there's a lot of considerations there from uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, the, 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 the data and the other arguments about why that's so key. And as my speech, you know, my remarks today really highlight and reinforce a lot of those, echo a lot of those. There's some legal uh, considerations that we can't ignore. And so we're just trying to, we have to reconcile all of those and we will see that in the NPR. And we invite everyone to comment. I mean, that's what the comment period is for us to, you know, have we thought about this clearly? Have we balanced these things in the right way? And if not, tell us what a better way is. And that, that's part of the comment process. Thank you. Um, use of alternative data in bank <laughs> underwriting. Swipe left for no, swipe right for yes. And, and I know there's gonna be a big caveat here. So, so you're starting to learn my, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, yes, so I would say yes, and, and I think it's good to go back to why. Why, 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 why is that a yes? And it's because everyone who is credit worthy should have access to credit, period. That's the principle. So how do we achieve that principle? Well, you've got these, what I would say, they're proxies for credit worthiness or, or credit scores and other methods. If you can get it more right, we should do those things. The challenge is sometimes these alternative, it's, again, these things can be used for good. Sometimes they, they, can, they can have um, uh, uh, not, not either unintended or not good impacts. Uh, and I think a lot of the focus on say AI and machine learning and getting folks where that big data kind of puts them into a trap, that's bad. So again, I, I think we have to be careful wide-eyed as we go into those. Uh, and the good news is I think some of the, not all, but some of the uh, firms that are playing in that space, they're cognizant of that. And so they're, they are trying to be thoughtful and careful about how to do that. And I think that's where engagement with community organizations, regulators to say, hey, we're gonna show this, and we're gonna walk through this together uh, is productive. And I, and I just come back to my theme on engage, engage, engage. I think that's how you build trust because we have to build trust in these things. Right, going back to your, because there was a, a question uh, from a member about uh, about climate change. Going back to your question about climate change, you know, mm -hmm. does does given given the answer that you gave, does um, consideration of climate change or activities that that mitigate climate change does that belong in a CRA rulemaking? Is that part of the uh, is that part of the um, you know sort of uh, uh, parameter of, 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 of what you're looking at? Yeah, so let, let me, um, I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, and again, I'll just, I'll say defer to the, to the NPR uh, uh, for folks, but let me step back on and just 
talk about it a little bit more specifically, because I think this is an important issue that has been flagged. It's been flagged by both climate ad activists and I think community organizations that there's a potential tension here. And um, in those areas that may be prone to climate risk and therefore prone to banks managing their risk to that may be majority minority areas or you know, LMI communities. And so there would, there, we, ha we do have to be careful about not creating, you know, a, like almost like a climate red line map that impacts those communities adversely. Like we have to, we have to identify those and figure out what the solutions to those are. And th this has been flagged. I think a number of groups have identified this. In those conversations, I always ask, what's the solution? And everyone says, we're not quite sure yet. <laughs> like we're working on it. And I would go back to, we got to start talking about it. Like we got to start talking, we got it. It's not going to solve itself. And so it really doesn't require, I think, a lot of engagement between the community uh, organization world and the climate world kind of engaging to figure out how, to, what are ways of, of solving for that and working with us. Thank you. Probably a hundred more questions in the chat. We have about two minutes remaining and um, Mike, I do want to give you a moment for any closing remarks. I have one more swipe left or, 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 or swipe right. I, I guess I'll frame it in this way, Mike. If asked, would Mike Sue be willing to serve as permanent comptroller? Swipe <laughs> right or swipe left? If asked, yes, of course. I love this job. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic job. It's a fantastic job. It's a great agency. Uh, we're doing really great stuff. Um, so it would, of course, I'd be honored uh, for that. But you know, we'll we'll one day at a time. And and with that, we are at our hour. Lots of questions we did not get to. Want to um, want to thank uh, the audience uh, for their patience. Uh, thank uh, thank Mike uh, for being a good sport and for spending the time uh, with us for uh, you know for his answers. Mike, I'll give you. Uh, 30 seconds for any closing remarks, and then I have just a few uh, reminders as we close. I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Jesse, to you for, for hosting me today and for this opportunity to talk about uh, the CRA and, and, and all the other things that we covered today. Uh, I'm going to be going to bed tonight thinking about swiping right and swiping left and probably nightmares about getting it wrong <laughs> in my responses. But I really want to thank your members and your, organ your members who have, there have been I have learned on a whole host of issues. Overdraft is a great example. We're seeing some progress now. That's not something that just happened out of the blue. That's something that a lot of folks have been working on for a really long time. And they deserve the real credit for getting us to this point where we're finally making some progress. Uh, and so I think that that's happening across a number of areas. So thank you, uh, really appreciate that. And just engage, engage, engage. That, that's, that's what's gonna get us there. So thank you so much. Uh, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Thanks, Mike. And we'd be happy to have you back. Uh, a lot <laughs> of questions we did not get to. I'm just reading some of the chat here and lots of engagement uh, there. So I'll, I'll just um, thank the NCRC members again and, and our audience and participants for their thoughtful questions. I um, want to encourage uh, folks who are on, if, if you'd like to join or learn more about NCRC membership, visit ncrc.org slash membership or email our membership team at membership at ncrc.org. And want to encourage everybody to fill out the survey um, uh, for this event, uh, which is in the chat. And also uh, look for a follow-up email to today's event uh, with a link uh, to the recording. Um, so thanks. Uh, thanks once again uh, to Mike for doing this, for being a good sport. And thanks to all of you. And uh, with that, uh, we will close. Thank you. Take care.